Um, I'm, I'm really very pleased to introduce our special guest this morning. Um, I could spend a lot of time singing her praises and listing her accomplishments, but I'd rather take that time to um, speak to her and to have you get to know her as I do. Um, suffice, to, suffice to say, she's a designer, an architect, an artist, a photographer, a teacher, um, and um, a counselor, a writer, a philanthropist, and a guru to a generation of designers. Um, some of us seem to struggle with having one life. She seems to have several simultaneously. So I'm delighted to be sharing those with you this morning. And um, we're going to glide through various phases of her life and give you an idea of how varied and rich it has been. So um, please welcome Cloda. Thank you very much. So we're seeing these little mantras along the way as we go. This is, uh, this is one of them. Um, but we'll start with um, your childhood, Cloda, and uh, your family, and tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in, you may be not surprised to learn that she's Irish. Uh, <laughs> so this is an example of what she might have seen uh, when she was a child. I'll tell you a little bit about my childhood. I uh, could probably spend three days, but I'll spend a few minutes. <laughs> I was born uh, to aristocratic, uptight, Protestant, uh, downwardly mobile family. <laughs> it, it lays the field here a little bit, what happened afterwards. Um, we changed houses five times before I was 17 in the downwardly mobileness. Um, I was brought up in the most beautiful part of the country and I spent a lot of my time out of doors running away from the house, which was stifling with all its furniture and silver and, you know, everything had to be polished and cleaned and fixed. And I, I really fell in love with nature and what it has to offer and our organic garden and, and uh, all these things you hold to you as you move forward in your life. And it's a huge influence to me. I told Michael I have one Kleenex in case I cry, by the way. <laughs> um. How, how, what, what size family was it? Uh, a brother and a sister, a father and a mother. And I know one of the things that w most interested me when we were talking, well, first of all, talk about the, the house itself. The well, the house, the house, the first house, the big house, was Moitura House. It was Oscar Wilde's country home, and his father had built it on the site of the Battle of Moitura. In fact, Oscar had his, inscribed his mother's initials in my nursery window. That lasted about seven years before we moved. But what did happen is uh, my brother was fascinated by language, and he, he was always running around giving quotes and telling jokes and stuff like that. So the flexibility of the Irish language was, uh, very, was really very good for me, very inspiring. Oscar's quotes. He gave me uh, the epigrams of Oscar Wilde, and I read it constantly and quoted lines of poetry. Did you ever feel his presence in the house? Yes. Yeah. I still feel his presence. I even was in the hotel in Paris where he died. Remember he said, either the wallpaper goes or I go. Right. The wallpaper uh, on stays. On his deathbed, yes. Enough, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that you've told me that's interested to me is, is your, your um, love of minimalism, and that had a lot to do with the fact that you didn't want to accumulate objects because you had to move so often. No, it's true. I mean, my life became a kind of continual moving van. I mean, five times, you know, it's, it's a lot of moves. And uh, actually, in addition to that, um, being downwardly mobile, my father, who would it thought only cads actually worked and earned money, who couldn't have a job or going to trade, actually sold the antiques that was through boarding school. And we had to spend a lot of time polishing that kind of thing you see up on screen um, and taking care of it. So I never, want to, I never want anything I put in a house or any house I design or any hotel or anything to need to have a nanny. It should be low maintenance and very, very little stuff. And um, you've always loved dogs. Yeah, my and this is Clota, as you may have that's guessed. That's me, actually. Uh, I was... Uh, 
I had to take care of my father's dogs. He bred dogs. He couldn't sell them, even, even though he was broke. But we had to take care of the dogs. There were 60 in the Moitura house when I was old enough to count. And, and we showed them. And that one was uh, <coughs> my curly-coated retriever. And um, I've loved dogs ever since with a, a lasting passion. You know, I break for dogs. <laughs> And although this is not a horse you knew, a horse uh, figured very um, uh, decisively in your life uh, when you were a teenager. A lot, of, a lot of my moves, or my big moves in life, have, co have come because of an accident. And this uh, horse that Michael is talking about uh, actually threw me. I came home from school. I was supposed to lunge him and he, he, uh, to, to calm him down, a very, very big horse. And he, he started to buck and he bust the girth of the saddle and threw me into the air and I fell on rocks and broke my back, in short. I was on my back for many months and my father had decided that I would go to uh, college because you were allowed to be a professor, by the way, in our family. You couldn't go into trade. You had to go into a profession, but not that one, obviously, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I didn't want to do mathematics and classics and did not want to be a professor. And I was lying on my back in my home and I opened the Irish Times and it had a little ad that says, why not be a dress designer? So I thought, well, how the hell not? I'll be a dress designer. So when I told my father, he threw me out of the house, did not want me back anymore, and only allowed me back in when I did my first fashion show and then it was all over the same Irish Times. So. I, if I had a T-shirt on now, it would say, why not, you know, just... And you were something of an instantaneous success. So. Yeah, because it, I was very young. I was 17 when I started my own business, so the press just loved that, and BBC made movies, and uh, I did very well. I exported all over the world, Australia and everywhere, and very much in the States, you know, Bandel's Lord and Taylor, people like that. Using natural tweeds, natural wools, natural linens, I worked at the Nar Irish Linen Guild. I, I, got a real love of the texture of Irish, of Irish fabrics, of Irish nets, and, and so on. And this is a kind of brought into what I do now. That and the color and the lighter shade in Ireland, which is unbelievable. <laughs> and in fact, actually, the, 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 you said that one dress in the knit dress, um, no, it doesn't go back, but uh, still exists, you said, yes? Hmm? The knit dress in that first slide, the fashion slide you said still exists? Yes, yes. yes. yeah, in fact, a couple, it, it's an amazing thing. This is a thousand years ago, I won't even tell you how long ago. But some of my clients still wear my clothes, and including Barbara Tober, the, the, uh, the president of MAD, you know, mm -hmm. Museum for Art and Design. So I got married, I had three children, and um, I involved them very much in my life. They, they, were, they were very artistic and great fun. Um, I made up stories for them. In fact, in my next life, maybe I'm going to do children's stories. I can't illustrate them. Now, somebody out there, out there who can illustrate children's stories, I'd love to talk to them. Because I, I love telling stories. I have, all, I have all these characters that actually I'm using now to, uh, for my grandchildren. The characters live on. And we had a big Georgian house in the, in, in the center of Dublin, and we had a very good time. And, and what did your husband do? My husband was in advertising. If anybody's seen Mad Men, then <laughs> here, hands up. <laughs> it was very much a Mad Men life, but very, very glamorous, tons of socializing, um, which I've never loved very much, but I did it. And, um, and also, in a sense, Going back to going back to Moitura House, even in, in even even in the downwardly mobile houses, there was always hospitality. If somebody came into the house, there was always the right tea. Fresh scones were made. You know, people were guests were honoured. And that's a thread that we will continue to follow yeah, it's, throughout it's, your, everything that you've done. Now, this is a quick trip to New York. You said that was my first trip to New York. My my then husband hated curly hair, so you will see it was ironed. <laughs> and that's in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art. Now explain the, uh, it, 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 I don't know, I can read it, it says, I don't care what Clotus says, what's the source of this? 
Well, the reason, the reason is I've always tried to be ahead of the pack. You know, I used to go out hunting before it was, uh, you know, when, before I broke my back. I like, always like to be ahead of the pack. And uh, when mini skirts look a little bit tired, I brought in maxi skirts. So the nun in the mini skirts thinks she doesn't care what Clodagh says, she's going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people thought I was very funny and made cartoons about me. So you were successful enough so that you were definitely a brand. Yes, in, in yeah, that, very much uh, so. In yeah. that time. All right, so fast forward to Spain. Suddenly you're in Spain with? With Daniel. <laughs> a, a, a new husband. New husband, changed husbands, countries, and careers. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. It came out pretty easily when I say it. <laughs> there were quite a few hiccups, to say the least. And I've, I went to Spain to recover from the first marriage, and I found the guy I'm with actually still. And we had a house in that little village called Mojácar, which is one of the white villages of Spain. And we had a house in an old square. Um, these so are some this, facsimiles, this, yes. Yeah. I mean, these no, this is the actual oh, this square. Is, this yes, one is I okay. actually, I was looking around for a photograph, I found the actual square. It's, it, it's actually, oh. funnily enough, my old house has turned into a hotel and a spa. <laughs> and I always had a lot of people working with me. I had, with, with outside shops and so on, I may have had as many as, as 200 when I was in the fashion business. So suddenly I am here with a new husband, not knowing what the hell to do with myself. So I said to him, look, I don't speak Spanish, and nobody here speaks English, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll learn to speak Spanish, and I'll fix the houses, and I'll, because we had a farm as well, and a little house in Mohawker. Uh, I'll fix the houses, and you just go off with what you're doing, which he was a screenwriter, and also is in real estate. So that's actually what happened. That's what the career change was, because of the old house under those arches, the townhouse. Um, it was, it was, again, every, every, every change has had a break, has, has been called, it has been a break of some kind, and whether it's a marriage, or in this case, a new career. I decided I would be an interior designer, hung out a shingle, again, without any training. My only formal training has been six weeks of pattern cutting before I did um, my fashion. And I've always been with people and brought people around me who are better than myself, who know more than I do. We have an incredible studio. We have an incredible fashion design studio. We have the best tailors, the best seamstresses, you know. It was always, always work with good people. So in a sense, in a sense I think my career is a little bit about orchestra conducting, you know. So anyway, back to the townhouse. Uh, it was a rabbit warren of horrible little offices that had been used for uh, some kind of, you know, uh, accountants or something like that. And I, I didn't know anything. I found an architect, and, and I said, I want all those walls out of there, you know, all the partitions and everything like that. And, and we had 16-foot high shutters. And the day of the demolition, the shutters were open to let out the dust, and the sun came in and hit the dust. It was like, it made it like a moat of light. And it was like somebody hit me on the shoulder and said, you know, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do places that are clean and simple and wonderful. And that's how it all started. So I, when my husband came home that night, he said, uh, what have you been up to? I said, well, I, I, I'm doing a career change, you know, that the office downstairs, the street level, that's mine. <laughs> and did he ever say, well, how could you possibly do that? The you know, wonderful thing about my husband, uh, he said, you've nothing to fear but fear itself, and you can do anything if you really set your mind to it. So the, nec the next day when the house opened and, the, and the, I had hung out my shingle, the, there was a knock on the door, and I walked out and I saw this absolutely gorgeous Spanish guy, you know, with like eyelashes out to there, the whole thing. And he said, are you the English woman? I said, no, I'm the Irish woman. He said, close enough, will you design my bar for me? Well, bars are very close to the Irish heart, so that was a <laughs> no-brainer. <laughs> so again, fast forward to New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, something called um, your... Yes, it's, uh, it, we went to, uh, husband uh, went to New York, I didn't want to go, so I left him for a couple of months and then decided to follow him and, and see if I could make a career in New York. Um, I was walking down Madison Avenue and I ran into somebody who had actually photographed my townhouse when I was in the fashion and he said, what are you up to? And I said, 
I'm not in fashion anymore, I'm an interior designer at an architectural company, I said, will you, do, will you do my apartment and my advertising office for me? So my career started. And then when I was in Spain, I was working with artisans and weavers, and in Ireland, working with artisans and weavers, and I couldn't find anybody to work with in New York. It was before the, the, you know, the movement towards natural materials and stuff like that, and, and artists doing uh, artifacts. So we opened a store called Clodagh Ross Williams with Ivy Ross and Sherry Williams uh, in, in on, the, on St. Mark's Place, and we put together um, a collection of artists and designers, many of whom are still working with me. As we roll through these photographs, their art will be coming up, because we closed it when somebody threw a brick through somebody's BMW. It was down west, the East Village, and uh, was a pretty rough place at that time. And this is your logo, yeah? That was our logo. And that logo I brought from Spain, it means earth, water, and fire. All the elements and all the senses are what we work with. And this? This is the store in, in the East Village, Clodagh Ross Williams. We had art and construction are working with me still, they're those wonderful walls. And then I, then I moved my offices into the building where I am now. It's the old Brooks Brothers building, wonderful brick building on the, on the corner of Bond and Broadway, and brought my team there and expanded it. You haven't asked me any impertinent questions yet. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, well, those are, those, <laughs> maybe the audience has those. Um, all right, th and, and explain this as a symbolic of your work and life. And I, I, I'm constantly researching, constantly reading, constantly looking into modalities, you know, like biogeometry, feng shui, um, everything I can think of, building, building environmentally sound homes. So I liken myself, in a sense, to a water strider on, on, the, on the deep pond of knowledge. I'm very surface. I'm running around looking for stuff, and then when I find the stuff, I get the best person that I can find who can actually do that and I hire them to, to, for the job. So we've got, we've got a biogeometry guy who lives in Brazil who comes up to do the hotel in Miami. You know, it's, uh, we, they come from all over the world. And it's very exciting because I feel in a sense there's a red thread around the world. We're all connected and uh, we're all interdependent and it's, um, you get this group of people together, you can make things better actually. One of the things I think that makes your work uh, distinctive and uh, incredibly rich is the amount of travel you've done, and you seem to me to be something of a sponge in terms of soaking in enormous <laughs> amounts of influence. And having traveled uh, with you to a couple of wonderful places, I, I've seen you absorb what you see in ways that I've really never seen before. So is, is that a fair analysis? That's a very fair analysis. We when, when, we, when, when we're feeling a little tired in the studio, we, we are feeling what we call dry sponge. So we go out, and I get out on the road and come back wet sponge. And um, again, back to minimalism, these guys, these sadhus, have absolutely nothing. I photographed them in, in Nepal at Patipassionat. It's a temple, actually burning gap. They have absolutely nothing, and they were so happy. All they wanted to do was smile at me and hug me and embrace me. So I bring that back, and it's the color and the texture even in that photograph that, that I garner then to apply it somewhere else. And, and then we'll just show some of the places yeah, that you... Yeah, it's the Potala Palace in, in Lhasa. And you can see that by the bridal that the uh, Chanel brand goes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, even on the high plains of Tibet. <laughs> no. Oh, there you are, yeah. <laughs> no. It's really funny, it, it's really funny. And these women I love, and you know why I love them? They have two husbands. <laughs> <laughs> one for- they're, they're nomads. One for different functions, or? One for herding and one for the rest, I think. For the rest? For the rest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't, I didn't go into it too deeply, let's right, put it well. like that, but they were very beautiful. The, the tent is woven yak hair. And I'm fascinated, I, I, I have very nomadic nature, and I'm fascinated by tents. In fact, you were in a tent with me in Africa, not in the same tent, no, no way. <laughs> we, we were not going to speak of that, but okay. <laughs> but I was just in Abu Dhabi at, of all things, the Camel Beauty Festival. 
and I was camping in that tent on the right. And there is one of the beautiful camels. She actually kissed me, but I didn't put that on screen. I thought it might be embarrassing. Orange is the new black. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Cambodia. This is in Africa at the end of a safari. Something about, I'm passionate about Africa, passionate about every country. I've been in nearly 100 now. But Africa, the light and shade, and the sky seems to be bigger than anywhere else in the world. It's so beautiful. And that's the first class lounge and where the little plane comes in for safari. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the very high plains of Tibet, you know, it's, it's a mystical where the air is like nowhere else. And I was there around Christmas time and my phone worked and I was able to call my family from there. And that makes you realize how connected everything is. Traffic. Morocco. Um, and just to put a punctuation on that, um, you said you've been in 100 countries? Yes. Yeah. What's the next country you'd go to where you haven't? I think Mongolia. Yeah. Mm. I've been thinking about. I've been thinking seriously, because even though I don't show jump or do anything like that anymore because of the back, I, I have this dream of racing a, a pony across the plains of Mongo Mongolia. It sounds like a very nice thing to do. I suspect you'll do that. <laughs> um, we, you, you said before how hospitality was a thread in your life from early, and, and it's still a thread in almost everything you do, including residential. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's, it's uh, it, it, it residential, whether it's a residential building or whether it's a home, I fix it so that, that, so that hospitality can happen very easily. And of course, if it's a hotel, it's even easier to do that. But I'm interested in the movement now with, with developers and residential buildings. They very often are attached to a tower. To, and one tower is the hotel, and one is the residential building. So this is actually on, a building on the High Line. It's, it's residential. It's mainly known for its dog hospitality. 312 residents, 120 dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that kind of feeling of warmth, bringing in all the elements, addressing all the senses, addressing feng shui, using, for instance, uh, uh, art as a light, which is so you, things have to do double duty in my minimalistic life. But for instance, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're our, again, another thing that's happening in hospitality and residential, that people want a quiet room. They want to get away from their families. And one of the great things, <laughs> you know, it's just a few hours, you know, it's not a bad thing. You don't always have to go to Starbucks. You can have a place in your own home, right? Being alone in a crowd is okay too. And that's our mantra, that everywhere you walk, everywhere you look, you should see something beautiful. So one of the things I learned, I can't remember the name of the architect, He's a, he got the Prisca Prize, uh, he's a Portuguese architect, that he says, until, when you're designing, until you can walk through a space without the benefit of plans or elevations or renderings, walk through it in your own mind, your design, you haven't done, and that's what we do in our studio. We walk through the place. If you walk this way, what you see. If you walk that way, what you see. What you feel, what's the sound of your footsteps in the corridor? Should this be quiet? Should this be bouncy? That we're constantly challenging ourselves. And now we are in a hotel. Now we're, yes. no, we're actually next door to a hotel. That actually, that's a residence in the Mandarin Oriental oh, Tower in, in, got the, it. In, in New York. And the woman who lives there, who happens to be uh, Dr. Atkins widow, she's remarried now, uses room service all the time from the hotels, cleaning services from the hotel, and catering from the hotel. And that is the movement that's happening now. The hotel we're doing in um, Miami for East, which is, which I'm going there tomorrow to actually do the press opening. Um, they, have, um, they have a whole bunch of service departments where people can have long-term stays and all the joys of, uh, of service and, um, and get on with their lives. I mean, service has never been more important. I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think I've, I've ever worked so hard. <laughs> so service is very important, whether you're in your residence or you're in a hotel. And also under, understanding, understanding uh, what a person is is also understanding what a hotel is, because a hotel has a personality. 
And our job is to translate and interpret that personality and that brand. So for instance, a W is one thing, or hotels we're doing in Armenia is another, are another thing. And I think we have some, yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, I actually, I have to, I have a confession to make. I actually sleep around. I sleep around a lot. And in my business, I have to sleep around. <laughs> um, what is a hotel room mean? It's a place where actually more people have sex, apparently, than they ever have at home. <laughs> no, it's a place, way to get away, you know, and you can, you know, your bed, you can have be made up afterwards for you. Uh, so hotels are offering a quiet place, a sanctuary in a sense in the room. So when you go to your room, I don't think it should wow you. I think it, you should just go, ah, I'm there. You know, I can relax. I can look at a movie. I can read a book. You know, I can sit on the terrace. It's very, very important. I hate going to hotels that have over-designed rooms because I find them very exhausting. And this goes into the design. This that you goes into this design, yes, yes. For, for the W. In Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, this is W Fort Lauderdale. It's a million three hundred thousand square feet. It was my first big hotel, and we had a lot of challenges. Um, lighting, particularly because the, the turtles there, you know, you can't attract them from the beach, or they make turtle pizzas on the road outside. So we, 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 we the outside lighting has to be very dimmed. We bring, we bring in the environment of where we're working. So the inland waterways and, and the posts that the pelicans sit on were what inspired that massive bench, which is in the entry hall. So we bring in the colors and the light of, of, of uh, our surroundings. We walk around in the surroundings and look at the planting because we also involve ourselves very much in the landscaping. We're actually going to be opening two things in our office. We're going to have a permanent landscape consultant, and we're also going to have a permanent kitchen consultant. I mean, not sitting there at a desk, but somebody who yeah. knows us and works with us. So and bathrooms can, must be very glamorous. I mean, the first thing a lot of the, certainly a lot of the women in the audience we do is we rush into the bathroom, right? for a second and see whether we're going to like it or not and how it feels. And, and that actually sets up the tone of the place. And this is a wow. It's a quiet wow, but it, it's a real wow when you're there because we couldn't figure out where to put the staircase to the, uh, to the pool deck. And then we thought, heck, you know, I said, let's put it up through the pool. And that has been one of the, one of the biggest marketing tools our clients could use. And that's the thing in the hotel business also. You want to give them a lot of marketing tools in their toolbox, so even after the first big opening, there's other things happening like that. This has been called sexiest pool in the world, and I don't know what else. You see, you can see the swimmer as you walk up. And the little kids come up with their noses to it. It's like, it's like a shark tank, really, but just with people in it, you know? <laughs> no. And we bring the fire element, and again, we have the ROI, you know, you know the French for roi, R-O-I, is the king. Well, the return on investment is absolutely key in the hotel business. And those cabanas turn so much money for, for, for W, for Starwood. There's so much money, it's almost ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. We want our clients to prosper. So the theme there was water. We went through water. We, had, uh, we took a photograph and, and, and screened it and made it the wallpaper as you walk to your bedroom were underwater. So it was a whole water theme, water and sand and beach, because you're right on the beach. And that is one of the R rooms, the quiet rooms. And then we always want to put a smile on people's faces, so I put a radioactive green alligator on one of our, on our presentation tables, and they loved it. They liked it better in white. And now it's, it holds the remote when people come into their room, or if there's a special message for you from your loved one. And just a simple, quiet lounge, you know, in, a, in the, and then when you do disco, when you do bar, it's, an, it's another beat. It's like music, you know? You don't want, you don't want Chopin in a bar, necessarily. So, you know, that's 2,000 uh, oxidized uh, brass tubes with, uh, with LEDs at the tip of each one. And they can change light and color show, and people dance and drink and have a very good time. 
so people, in, in the beginning, people were very shocked. They looked at me as a very Zen designer, and the ex exact opposite. I can be Zen, but I can also want to go to a bar and a disco and make it look like one, not like something else. More hotel? Yeah, this is a hotel in, in Zargat in Armenia. Um, uh, it's, uh, we're now in our fifth hotel, actually, in Armenia. Most people don't even know where Armenia is, but <laughs> I had to, actually had to look it up. <laughs> and there again, we're bringing in the people. We're bringing in, like, we, I didn't say this, but the W, we brought in local artists. We're bringing in the, 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 the um, Armenian knitting ladies made the, made the bed covers because it's, it's not-for-profit that's helping the uh, older ladies to knit, and each, each blanket is different. And then it's very special. You're giving a, a taste. Like, if you go to a restaurant in Armenia, you don't necessarily want to have Japanese food first time, you know? You want Armenian food, and you want a taste of Armenian what you look at as well. That was, a, a, like, a 300-year-old cow, cow barn. It was uh, because it's... This is brutal weather in Armenia. That's in Zapotec. It's right up on one of the highest lakes in the world. And the weather, I went up there, and it's uh, in winter, and it's brutal. So they have to take the animals indoors for the winter. And that was about 300 yards, 300 feet long. And we turned it into uh, an event space for them. And the Armenians love to dance and sing. And, and it's uh, very, and so we, and they're kind of noisy. They would really, really have a good time, like the Greeks and the Irish, like myself. And so we try to get the event space a little bit away from the main hotel so that sleep is not disturbed. So th this, these hotels were for Chifankian, and I was also working on, on his rugs. We have a collection with him. And we, when we're working with anything for a showroom, we, we want to have the same hospitality. We want, in this case, a big table where people can sit and put down their purses and have their cup of coffee, or be offered a glass of water, a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. But there's nothing like hospitality. I, we did a showroom for Burlington some years back for Burlington Sheets, and I made a little cafe and a little place where uh, the, the buyers could put down their um, purses and make a private telephone call. They would force, before cell, cell phones were rampant, their sales tripled that season tripled, literally, because it was comfortable and hospitable. It's the right way to go. You're really doing the right thing in the hospitality business. And that's actually one of the people we had in Clodagh Ross Williams, Paul Chilcock, the fountain guy. It's nice, it's nice to see people coming on with you. It's like an extended family. Uh, we're very faithful to the people who work well with us. and. Uh, we're, in, we're really in tight touch, and it's, it's a lovely feeling. There's nothing like it. And always honoring them and honoring their work, because it's, uh, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard uh, job out there. Gloria Vanderbilt said something, and I, I saw it in New York Magazine recently. She said, be kind, because everyone you meet is find, fighting their own great battle. Everyone you meet. So that's Landmark. It's a restaurant. Restaurant, yes. Hmm? Restaurant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Go on with the... Landmark. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Mark is a star chef, and he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience for me because I like to go into the underwear. I like to go back of house. I like to see the prep kitchen. I like to see the cold rooms. And, and also, I really honor the staff because if you don't have happy staff, you do not have the right atmosphere in your, in your uh, restaurant, hotel, or anything. So we actually... We, work, we made a racetrack for the servers because it's, it's 10,000 square feet, it's a very long restaurant. So the servers didn't have to, have to kind of bump around the bar people. And they were literally crying with gratitude that we cared, you know. And uh, we, we actually made a, went to the cooking line and made a few moves as well. So normally restaurant designers only work with the restaurant itself or the people, you know, the front of house. And we insist on looking at back of house. And th then everything does well. We add the feng shui, we add all our modalities, and then everything does well. Because prosperity is, is, is absolutely key. And we like using art in corridors. We like, so it, it, it's still the same restaurant. Um, the guy's an art collector, so we gave him a lovely long art, 
art corridor when you go down to the to the to the kitchen, because otherwise it would have just been a, you know a, a corridor with wait, wait staff running up and down it, and people love that. Now to move on to uh, something that you are particularly noted noted for, and I think you were just inducted into the International Spa Hall of Fame. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Terminology. Yeah. Thank you for remembering. That. Sure. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think you can read that, yes. Um, so let's look at a couple of those uh, yeah. projects. And, and I don't know if there's anybody who doesn't love a spa. Katie and I came in last night and we were wrecked, you know, and we w went for a little session up in the, uh, the bathhouse in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Delano, and we were unwrecked and went to bed happy, just, you know, an hour in a spa. I love doing spas for that reason. This is spa and, and uh, it's sleeps about, I think, the, 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 the whole resort is Miraval, sleeps about 250, 300 people now. In and Tucson, yes. Hmm? Tucson? Tucson, yeah. Have anybody here been there? Nope. Yeah, few. Katie. <laughs> no. Oh, there's somebody back there. Yeah. yeah. But please go, because it's one of the jobs that I really, really loved working on, because it was a very unhappy place when I got there. It was an a indigenous American ground, and bad things had happened there. We actually had to fly in our, our feng shui master because we were all feeling, feeling the pain. And uh, now it is a beautiful, happy place. And, and we're doing actually 15 villas for them. We did 15 villas for them and they've all sold out. And, and that was during the downturn time to, too. So it's, uh, it's a question of if you, give something, if you give something to your client that makes them happy, then they put their hands in their pockets and they will pay because you're giving them, you're giving something they can take home with them. Because you can never, Spanish ever saying that which you have danced can never be taken away from you. Good experiences will linger in your mind and create a lovely nostalgia that you can take with you anywhere. That's why I travel so much. I mean, if my, if my inner video is going to crack my brain one day, <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff in there. Still See, Miraval? Yeah, that's Miraval. And again, if you're in the hospitality business or designing for hospitality and, the, and, the, and it's already existing, when they, somebody, somebody has to uh, uh, close some rooms so they can, uh, you know, so can they redo them, we actually had some land there at Miraval and we said, well, hey, why don't you bring in six tents for your six rooms? And we've got in safari tents from Africa and people just love them and they're still there. They, they were semi-temporary, but they're still there. And people like it. The nice thing about a tent, when you open the flap, uh, and we built a fence all around it, you can go out actually and sit naked if you feel like it or with your towel on, and you've got the birds and the butterflies outside and the scent of the desert and the sounds of the desert. And if you can bring that to people, it's the joy of anybody here who goes to the beach and is, has experienced an outdoor shower knows what I mean. You become part of nature instead of a, instead of a an intruder, right? <laughs> no. right, we can, right? I think that's misspelled. Dear. <laughs> another spa. So this is another spa. Um, it's called Sasanqua. It's Keough Island Resort developers. Um, when I went there first, I saw this bird, and it's a protected marsh, and I said to that bird, I will never hurt you. <laughs> no. I will never hurt you. Um, and we went out and walked in the marsh to see what the surroundings were, li were like, actually. When we came back in, we saw a sign saying, beware of alligators, do not go out in the marsh, but I'm still here. <laughs> no. And we were the architects of this, too. So we took the, the color and the texture of the palm, the, the palm trees, and we, our, our plaster is the color and texture of the palm trees. And doors are incredible, you know, for hotels or anywhere else. It, a door really... It, it tells you what's going to, it, it creates an, an experience, the experience of opening a door onto something, of what's going on behind the doors. So we always put a lot of emphasis on our doors and what you see inside the door. And in, you know, in, a, in, in spas, for instance, you, you, don't want, you don't want wild, wild sunlight, blasting sunlight. So we created a grid and slats, so there's a changing runner of light as you walk down to your spa room. And then we, we mimic that at night by putting uh, lights that actually cast shadows. They didn't change, you know, but it's just 
constantly using light as your friend, using light and shadows as your friend. It just makes such a, you feel you're walking in nature even if you're inside. You know, we've all had the hospital experience, going to visit somebody in hospital, the fluorescent lights all along the corridor. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just telling you, you know. So how can we bring nature inside, bring the outside in and the inside out? It's, it's what we do. Those live oaks came right up through the, through the deck. So we did, in, in, the course, in the course of our work, we actually met some wonderful people and we designed for them, we designed collections for them. And we want to align ourselves with people who, who do good, who actually are philanthropic, who keep their factories clean, fair trade, um, and, and then we all do well. And you feel you're doing good for the world, and that's nice. And then, you know, we make lots of money, that's nice too, you know? <laughs> So uh, we, we have many collections now, and, and uh, the Spanish have a saying, dime con quien andas y yo te diré quien eres. Tell me who you walk with, and I'll tell you who you are. Well, that's what we feel about the people we license to, that we feel, we feel very safe and comfortable with them. That's actually an installation I, we did recently for a licensee, Porcelanosa, just working with stone, hammering stone, getting the heart of the stone, smooth stone, and combining it with teak to just make a very comfortable feeling. I think good design should be co-ed. Uh, hotel rooms should be co-ed. You know, you don't want to, if you're, if, you're, if you're a kind of, you know, if you're a football star, you don't want to go into a pink frilly room, you know. With, have you ever been in those hotels where you have to actually take seven pillows off the bed before you can get into it? We don't do that. <laughs> so it's this kind of minimalism <laughs> that turns me on. <laughs> and this leads us into what uh, is going on with Cloda and uh, at present and in the near future. Well, this is this is my this is the something that's opening actually in July. It's uh, it's it's a big resort in the Douro Valley for new clients of ours, six senses, who are really wonderful because they are exactly that. They you know they al align themselves all the senses and all the elements. And since in the wine country, it's all about wine. Even, the, even some of the treatments in the spa are going to be about, about wine, about you know, with, with uh, you know, cleansing yourself with grape, grape seed and stuff like that. And we like wine in, we like wine out, being me. <laughs> no. And we actually took some of the old, we, were, we, were out, we, we went out for a couple of hair-raising rides because it's very hilly, that, that area in Porto, the Douro Valley, the Douro River running, running down below. And we went out to some of the old villages and we met a woman who was in her 80s who was baking bread and we wanted to bring that feeling into the kitchen for the, for the main dining room. So we, we took the old Portuguese tiles, we, we, sent, we sent a task force out. Um, Daniel, our brand director, went and found ancient tiles and that's what's going to be their rendering of what's going to be happening in the dining room. Huge old limestone Portuguese fireplace. So I don't mind bringing in the past if it's relevant. I don't want to look in the rear view mirror if it's not relevant. But it's giving people a sense of, of place, I think, that's important. You, are, you know, you are where you are. And when I'm in Portugal, I want to be in Portugal. And that's the, that's the very, very serene bedroom we did. Again, it's like an ah. And um, just to uh, wrap up a few of the things that uh, one might call extracurricular, but uh, I don't think anything for you is extracurricular. <laughs> and, uh, I don't your, what does that word mean, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> it means outside of the realm of your work, but it really isn't because photography is, uh, uh, has been an avocation, but you managed to uh, blend it in with, it, with the kind of design work you do as well. And these are your photographs, some of your photographs. These are my photographs, and, I, and one of the things everybody in the room who is a designer understands that it takes forever. It's, it's the, the, Gestation period of an elephant has nothing to do with the amount of time it takes to get a hotel born. Sometimes it's three years, four years, you know, two and a half years. And I, I, I like instant results. And I decided I like to study water. And I'd read the book, The Hidden Messages in Water by Dr. Omoto. And I, I look at water to find message, messages in it. But these are my water photographs. And then I realized that, I, that people liked them and started to buy them, so to my great pleasure. Actually, they're all over the Santa Monica Village uh, job that I'm doing. I ran in under the Santa Monica Pier, 
uh, the tide was coming in. I could have won the wet t-shirt contest afterwards, <laughs> but I had the, I had my photographs and they're all over the, res the, the uh, building, so it's very nice. And I also love graffiti, and that may seem weird when you like water, but there's something about the fluidity of graffiti and the lack of, you know, it's not, people aren't actually sit, sitting there studying, you know, they just do it, you know? And I, I'm a bit like Nike, I like to just do it and I like to capture what has just been done. And it's ephemeral. Capturing the ephemeral is also interesting to me. The dog with the crown, you know, <laughs> yeah. And also you have become quite famous for your philanthropy and particularly Thorn Tree, uh, which I have been the beneficiary of in terms of having seen your work there firsthand. Um, so talk a little bit about Thorn so, Tree. So uh, quickly, quickly back, my parents, although they were downwardly mobile, my mother always found time to meet the villagers in the big house and then in the smaller houses and to give them things and pass things on. And uh, one of the things, when I went sent off to boarding school, fueled by the antiques my father was selling, they actually asked us to choose a charity, which was really quite avant-garde then. So we I chose a charity. I, I, chose, I looked after an old woman but during my period in boarding school. And I've always liked to help people. I think it's a win-win it's it's an, it's a, it's a win situation. They feel good, you feel good. So we found these kids in Africa through a friend of mine who was traveling through Africa. and. Uh, her jeep broke down, and this tribe came to help her with the jeep and her two, her two companions. And uh, she asked what she could do for them, and they said, well, t educate our children. They were all totally illiterate. Only the chief could read and write. And uh, we've been working with them now for 13 years, and we have nearly 2,000 children going to school and now to high school and college. We've put in wells and David Ashens on our board of directors, thank you very much. <laughs> no, we, we, we've done a lot and it's very good to see and it's now almost self-supporting because the kids who are going down learning to be plumbers and teachers and tourist, tourist guys and so on and so forth are sending money back to the Maniata. So where before when there was a drought and the cattle died, sometimes the warriors suicided because it, that's, that was their means of money. It was like disaster on Wall Street. Um, so we've been able to help a lot, and it's, it's, a, it's really nice. We're bringing over the Warriors next year, if anybody wants to be at Donna Karen's probably next year, uh, at, at Urban Zen, we're going to bring the Warriors over, and, and one of the girl, one of the girl uh, students. They've been very hard to get them in, very hard to get a passport a visa for them. First girls educated. That's why I did the boarding school for the girls, because they're pastoral nomads, so they have no way of Going, going beyond being in these little preschools unless they have somewhere to stay. So we, we focused on boarding schools. And there are the warriors in New York. They'd never set foot on Tarm Academy. They had never had running water in a faucet. I mean, everything was new and exciting. It was like, it was like seeing a small baby. You know when you see a little baby discovering the world? It was a bit like that. And they discovered mirrors. They'd never seen themselves in the mirror, and they're very vain. We couldn't peel them off the mirrors. <laughs> we had a big mirror coming off our elevator, and all the warriors were there, you know, doing it. <laughs> it was very nice. And finally, we come full circle. We were uh, talking before about balancing work and family, and um, you continue to do that. Um, but this is your granddaughter, yes? That's my granddaughter, and, 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 and Laika, the dog. So we've got eight grandchildren between us now, my husband and I, and they're absolutely great. And they're, they bring us nothing but joy. And also um, challenge us into, into new ideas, keeping fresh, and know, and know a lot more about IT than we do. You know, they're teaching us. You know, there's, um, there's up coaching, right? Co coaching, or coaching your parents and your grandmother, parents how to use, how to use uh, devices. Indeed. Uh, we have time for some questions, uh, so if you do, please wait for the uh, microphone. Is Katie around? Okay. Uh, or so, uh, are, do we have any questions for Clota? I think there's Just... another slide, another image. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> it's okay <laughs> because I like the last, not that one, but the last image, the one I like. <laughs> any questions? It's hard for me to see, so if there are, just stand up and ask. Just 
just one more image, Michael. Oh, sorry. And please, you can ask me. Um, you can ask me anything you like, actually. Maybe not the size of my waist, but if you have any other questions, that's fine. Yes, there's someone over there. Hold on. Microphone is coming. And thank you all for listening. I see nobody's fallen asleep. I was scanning the room. Yeah. <laughs> no. Hi, hi, Kaloda. Um, great keynote, by the way. Uh, my name's Mark from a Design Commerce Agency. I want to ask you, um, how's your Spanish? How's my Spanish? Did you say? Yes. Yeah, muy bien, gracias. Puedo hablar como quieres. Quieres venir aquí? Eso. I was wondering, how is your Spanish, I mean, in your designs, you went to Spain to live in Spain for a while. How is your, how's, how's the Spanish infused in your designs? Oh, that's, you know, I'm getting goosebumps just telling you. The old, the old uh, aldeas in Spain, you know, the farmhouses where when they have, the family has a baby and they build another one on and another one on, that kind of communal living was very interesting to me. Uh, the, the, the waterways in, in Granada, the water, and the fountains in Granada, I mean, and the old, the old Alcazabas, like, up the street from where we lived, there was an old Alcazaba, and this totally influenced my garden design, my landscaping, just the use of stone and the use of water steps. The, the, the Moors did incredible landscaping. And then the north of Spain, Galicia and so on, is very, is very much like uh, Ireland, so it was hauntingly beautiful for me. And the colors of Spain, and, and, you know, the, and the dancing and the joy, you know, going into the caves with the gypsies in Granada, you know, and dancing with them. I actually danced on a table in a cave in Granada. Would you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I do. So it's a it's huge influence. We love Spain. We go back all the time. And we're bringing the whole family back now to, um, to Malaga for, and to an old farmhouse for, uh, for July. Anyone else? Yes. It's a hand up there. Wait for CC. Loda, great um, seminar. Thank you for starting us off. Uh, Elizabeth from Insight Interior Design. And I'd like to hear about kind of the logistics of doing overseas projects. Um, do your clients, do you stay for a few weeks during design process or do you come back to the States, to your New York office? Or, and are your clients paying for your visits or is that something you do? So the general logistics. Logistics of overseas design, you usually pay for yourself if you want to get the job. When you go out to, you know, go out, if, they, if they invite you out, you pay for your fare out and you go out and you get the job. So we're doing a hotel in Brazil, we're doing one in, one in Portugal. The one in Portugal, because he wanted in a hurry, I said, you've got to pay my fare, I'm not going out. <laughs> no, no. So what happens is you go there and you have a very intense time. We write really intense programs. We write a narrative. So the narrative is there when the press happens. We don't have to go back and invent a story. We write, we, we write actually before we design. Back to the words in Oscar Wilde. We really, we really write a haunting narrative of what we expect people to go through. And doing work at a distance isn't as difficult as it seems because usually there's an architect of record on site. Um, and of course, uh, we can email. We can email all our digital, you know, our, our drawings and so on. So. You know, 80 drawings can go out and, and be, be handled by the architect over there. And, they, and of course, the client always has a project director. And then we go, to, we go back at interim moments. Um, usually, we go back at the big value engineering moment. We usually have to go back to see how we can maintain the place and make it really beautiful, even though we have to take stuff away. Um, I'm going out to, going to Portugal next in June first week in June, and then I'm going back for the opening in July. So, and they pay for that, because it's part of the publicity, you know, for them too. I, I mean, you know, if you, if you are a designer, they need you, and if you just must understand that, you're very important, you know? <laughs> you know, you're really very important, the architects and designers, because we're the people who, who really, together with the market, their marketing team and our marketing team, we generate the brand for them. We generate the publicity that makes travel and leisure and people like that write about it, the overseas people. And hospitality design, you know, every, everybody. So, uh, so we're kind of, uh, I've never been uh, somebody who, 
I always speak up. I say what I want. Uh, I call myself a sensitive ar army tank once, and my husband said, not that sensitive, but that's another story. But I will go on and on and on until I get what I want. I just had a huge coup on East, the hotel we're opening, <laughs> because I just went on and on and on. Because if you're authentic and you want something in a job, because it means something, and for heaven's sake, you know, how do we market ourselves now? Selfies. You have to give people selfie spaces, <laughs> a wall for a selfie. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easy. I mean, communication is so easy now. It's, it's, it's really easy to work overseas. And it actually is another good thing about it, working overseas, because you, 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 fly, you, fly, you fly in and you tell them what to do, and then you fly away. And when you come back in again, if they haven't done it, you can, you can carp and be difficult. Well, let me first again uh, thank uh, Walters for making this possible and providing our chairs. So thank you, Ken, and your staff um, very much. And, um, and let me just say, I think uh, any time spent with you is a pleasure. And um, I think your inner video is something that we would all love to have access to. Uh, and I, you know, I envy and admire you, and it's a pleasure to have you as a friend. Thank you. So then let's thank Cloda. So you have, you have one last slide, which is our Facebook. And our Facebook. And, oh, oh, it's there. Oh, it's there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, guys. Thank you.